and good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome to another episode of Niner here in association with the Alex Kirsch Project and in association with the 365 Broadcasting. We are streaming live from YouTube but this episode will also be available on Podbean and Patreon. Are you a movie buff? Me too. If you want to hear some good solid reviews on everything movies, TV, music, video games and all things social media, Niner is your new one-stop shop for all things entertainment. But this review show will not pull any punches. This isn't your typical review show. It's not your normal entertainment review. Be advised, you are entering a spoiler zone. My guest tonight hails from Williamsburg, Pennsylvania, and is a co-host on the podcast Bridging This Gap, which can be seen every Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with his partner, Crime Coach. They talk about all things social, political, economical issues, but want to bridge things between difference of opinion in hopes of to forming a better understanding of each other's arguments. But today... He and I are going to talk about three movies that we selected at random, and we will rate them based upon a certain scale. I will rate on my scale, he will rate on his scale. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Niner, the co-host of Bridging the Gap, Devin Saylor. What's going on, Devin? How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. How about yourself? Oh, I can't complain one bit. It is Friday. I don't have to work tomorrow, so that's Ooh. a good news right there. So, Got to get down on Friday, as Alyssa Black once said. <laughs> it was Rebecca Black, wasn't it? No, you're right, Rebecca Black. I'm sorry. Yeah, the one who I said, Alyssa. We all, we all, for, we all for, can forget her. I mean, did yeah. anybody even remember that reference? Let's be real. I don't uh, think too many got it. Well, the thing is, like, I literally is, I remember uh, talking about that is just like how terrible the music video was and how terrible the song was. I mean, the unfortunate mm-hmm. thing was, like, unfortunately, she was picked on a lot because of it, which I don't condone really. But the thing mm-hmm. is, it's like people are just assholes. So. <laughs> Right, right. Well, I mean, if you make fun of the production, I don't think it's a big deal. Like, if you make fun of the production, the fact that, you know, that you really can't sing. But, like, not come at her as a person. Like, okay, well, at least you went for it. You know, your dream yeah. or whatever it was you wanted to do. But Yeah. Yeah, it's just, ugh, God, it's horrible. So, but anyway, I kind of gave everybody the 30,000-foot view of you. So, why don't you go ahead and fill everybody else in, uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself and why you got into doing uh, podcasting. Okay. Well, hi guys. Uh, my name's Devin and I'm currently missing a headphone. So let me actually move this over and do a little bit more lighting here. Okay. Well, it's apparently still wants to go away. So anyway, um, <laughs> hi guys. Uh, my name's Devin. Uh, I am co-host of the Bridging the Gap show, which is a show where we talk about social, political, economical issues, but it's really just about anybody who can disagree on just about anything. Uh, we talk about um, controversial topics, but also we talk about like lighthearted stuff and just have a little joking around kind of thing. You know, um, everyone from the whole six, nine incident from, uh, uh, Elon Musk naming his son some crazy name that's letters and numbers um, <laughs> to just about. And, and also, you know, I mean, anti-vax versus racist uh, agendas in America. We talk about all those different things and it's fun and we have a good time, um, but also have really good uh, discourse and information to provide. Um, on top of that, I am also the CEO and founder of my own media production company, Media to Media, uh, where I am in production for various videographer videography projects, um, including for business and so on and so forth. So, um, that's what I do. Um, eventually, I want to make films, and I also want to make um, music. So, be a music production studio as well, kind of like a one-stop shop. So, there you go. Well, what kind of movies and uh, music you want to go into, actually? So, I have. I mean, this is interesting. So, obviously, hip hop, rap music has my heart. Mm-hmm. Um, but movie-wise, I'm weird. I like monster movies. Okay. As, as evidenced by some of the choices you saw whenever we randomly selected a list to pick from. Yeah, uh, because I I don't know what it is. Since I was a kid, I grew up on like Alien and Godzilla and um, oh, yeah. Ali- Aliens is one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, and and I just I don't know what I liked about monster movies. Now I used to like the sci-fi originals like when I was younger. Yeah, but I tried to go back and watch them, and I can't no more because the CGI is so bad and the acting so bad. Like I can't even laugh. I yeah. feel like it's like a betrayal of myself because when I was younger, I used to think those movies were good. Mm-hmm. And they're just playing up not so. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I completely get that. I mean, I grew up watching these same kind of monster movies, but science fiction has always been like my thing. I, science fiction is like my go-to, like uh, my all-time favorite um, uh, science fiction story. You know, Denis Villeneuve just directed uh, Dune. It's going to be coming out this year. It's one of my all-time favorite science fiction stories. Uh, my all-time f- favorite uh, video game is Mass Effect. I mean... Mm. My, my second favorite movie of all time is Avatar, and I know I get a lot of grief for that, but mm. I just love Avatar really? that much. People give you grief for liking Avatar? Yes. It's Why? Of, Avatar's a great movie. It it's a long story, and probably the person one of the persons going to watch this, Queenie. <laughs> she's going to say why she doesn't like it, but that's okay. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. But um, okay, right. before we actually get into our topic, so when it comes down to hip hop, okay, who's your favorite rapper of all time? 
Oh my goodness. That is so hard. You know, a long time ago, I would have told you it was Eminem, mm -hmm. but the thing is, is like, I've listened to his new stuff and I just can't get behind it. And, and yeah. truth be told, if, if you just looked at me and said, I had a favorite rapper of all time, mm -hmm. I can't because the 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 rap the rappers that I listen to they're always constantly changing. If I had a favorite rapper right now, mm -hmm. it's J Cole. Yeah. But if it if like all time like who I think is the best of all time, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. Um, and that's up for interpretation and opinion. Oh, yeah. Everybody has their own pick on it. But me, I listen to so many artists that I can never just say definitively, "Oh, here's my dude." I don't have one. But right now, like my guy, I currently am favoring is uh, J Cole. So. If I had to pick my top three, right, my number one is Mystical because that guy used to motivate the hell out of me all the time. I mean, he's got that style that's just like it motivates the hell out of you, right? Number two is Tech Nine. I love Tech Nine mm -hmm. because the guy can rap, but the thing is he's incredibly fast, but he can enunciate his words. To me, that says a lot about his talent, though. Right, very and, talented. And number three is Chameleon Air. I know Chameleon Air has really been off the market for a while, but the Sound of Revenge, I think I could listen mm. to the Sound of Revenge over and over and over again because there's a lot of good stuff in there a lot of good lyrics in there so right i mean there's like uh, i'll bring up a non-disclosed artist that i usually don't a lot of people don't know like i, I listen to but there's a guy named king iso mm -hmm. and i love his music because it's so it, for one it's lyrically engaging he has a sick flow yeah. and he, he what he what he raps about i mean like are like real topics and things and he and he has such great wordplay and to me yeah. that's what rap's all about to me you got wordplay you got oh, wordplay sure. you got flow if you can make, if you can say some poetic things, because that's what I think rap really is. It's just like poetry with, yeah. with music behind it. it. It really is. I mean, most most music is poetry. It's just interpreted and it's just uh, expressed differently. And, you know, I mean, I did an episode um, two weeks ago about the power of music and like how it moves us and how it just influences us and makes us do things that, you know, that you do in private. You could be in your apartment dancing like an idiot. But the thing is, like, that's what music does to you. And then last week I actually had a... a a guest and he's actually a manager for uh bands here and there and he talks about his love of music i mean music just does something to the soul i mean i i can't describe it but we're getting a little bit off topic right here right, so. right we're getting we'll circle back to movies i will say one more thing about me and mm -hmm. I, a movie i would love to make someday um if disney will let me sometime i would like to make the standalone general grievous movie oh really really it's, it's oh, a weird dream of mine yeah well i i love yeah i love general grievous as a villain and he never gets enough props like not just with his backstory but like as he was like in clone wars the, the, if you, did you watch the cartoon series clone wars i i didn't watch the cartoon series no the the well the cartoon series that was like 2003 he was like fantastic badass you know we got to see him like take go to coruscant kidnap chancellor palpatine all mm -hmm. that like and like I, when i was younger i was like man general grievous is just be you know the best yeah but then then they did him dirty in the 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 animated series because th they like introduced Darth Maul back into the universe of Star Wars like in, in, in Clone Wars and I was like why like we had villains build on the villains that are around in this era why did you have to bring this guy back yeah you know and it was because they've everybody thought well Darth Maul didn't get enough props and I was yeah. like mm, listen okay <laughs> like Darth Maul had his six okay he got he got he got screwed up you know if you want to make that go back to like like pre like make another tv show about like before the republic like yeah. old republic and then do something on darth maul don't do darth maul don't bring darth maul in here you know in the clone wars and but yeah. they already did it it's canon can't be changed so i would like to do if i could i would like to go do the general grievous uh original movie like if he got his own standalone telling his backstory and whatnot and that'd be dope to me did you ever see that youtube video where General Grievous has like a million lightsabers, and then when he actually like swings it around, he ends up killing himself. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah, that's that was hilarious. Funny. That is hilarious. All right. So, all right. So, anyway, going into our topics tonight. Okay. So, what Devin and I did is I picked five movies, he picked five movies, and then what he did is he put those into a, a wheel or something like that. Yeah, like a like a rotational wheel that randomizes the movies. Yep. And then what we did was we were gonna vote, and we decided we we're gonna talk about three different movies. And we agreed that if we hadn't seen the movie, that we would watch it before now. Fortunately, I've seen all these movies. He's seen all these movies. So, fortunately, we can have a good opinion about it, okay? So, the first movie we're going to talk about is Godzilla. Let's set the record straight, okay? This is the Godzilla movie from 1998. I saw this movie in theaters. When I went and saw it in theaters, I loved it. I had the best time ever. 
I watched this movie like religiously when it came out, and then I watched the movie not too long ago, and I'm like, why the hell did I like this movie? This movie's terrible because mm -hmm. I grew up watching Godzilla versus uh, King Kong versus Godzilla, son of Godzilla, watching Godzilla versus Mega Godzilla, Godzilla 1985. I watched a lot of the classic Godzilla movies. I loved watching Godzilla, but then along comes you know the makers of Independence Day. And they decided that they wanted to kind of throw a little twist into it. Uh, first things first, I mean, okay, so for those that don't know, it's essentially, for those that know about Godzilla, a giant reptilian monster services leaving destruction in its wake as it strides into New York City. To stop it, an earthworm scientist, his reporter ex-girlfriend, and other unlikely heroes team up to save their city. It was directed by Roland Emmerich. It stars Matthew Broderick, who's the earthworm scientist, uh, Jean Reno, who is one of the most famous French actors in history, um, Maria Patillo, who played the girlfriend, and Hank Azaria for the comic relief, honestly. I mean, just got to call it like we see it. So, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and go first, okay? So, because, like, when I found out this is what we're doing, I was, like, chomping at the bit for it, okay? So, first things first. For those that don't remember what my rating system is, my rating system is the following. I go based on cinematography, musical score, CGI special effects, acting, voice acting, story, and then I give a final score about it, Okay. So first things first, we'll talk about the cinematography. I'm going to give the cinematography like a 5 out of 10, honestly. I just felt like when I first watched it, I felt on the edge of my seat. When I watched it again recently, I nearly fell asleep. I just felt that the cinematography, the camera angles were dreary. They were boring. They were just, uh, to me, they were, seemed very amateur. I know it's easy for me to say, but, you know, these are the same guys that did Independence Day. And the cinematography in that movie is mind-blowing. It's like, <gasps> Oh my god, it's amazing. But then here they come with Godzilla. It's like, really? This is the best you could do right here? I mean, I, I, it wasn't awful, but it was like average, I think. Average. And I, I just think that maybe they could have done a better job like they did with the new movies. Like, I love the new Godzilla movies. I think that they are great. Like, when I watched the 2014 one, I was thrilled. When I watched King of the Monsters, I was like, oh, this freaking movie's amazing. But you know we're talking about the 1988 one. So uh, what do you think? Of, uh, what do you think so far? Well, if we're talking about cinematography, um, you know, there's a couple of scenes that jump out to you where there are good jobs done in here. Where you know there are parts where, like, for instance, the scene with the uh, like that. Even though realistically, in the whole scheme of things, it wasn't like the uh, most practically applicable because the CGI, which we'll get into in a little bit, isn't probably up to par. But like you know, with the scene with the old man on the dock, and like we have this like this like arching wave come, and it has like these spikes, and like those scenes are cool. And yeah. like you know, there's certain shots that are cool, like where he hugs the Empire State Building. But outside of that, I mean, you really don't have too many like good cinematography scenes that like look that just things that jump out at you. Yeah, exactly. You know, they're not very eye catching, and most of the time too, it's also because we're at this like very little level when we're looking at this thing. You know. Absolutely. Um, in terms of perspective and ha half the, and also too, I think it is the CGI when you have something that looks like how Godzilla looked in this film. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we'll get to that. We'll get to we, that, but I'm we, just saying he did. It just does it look, you might as well just be looking at a, a inflatable balloon. Couldn't agree more. Macy's day parade. <laughs> yeah. Right. Bingo. Uh, musical score. Okay. The musical score was very action cliched. The soundtrack was amazing though. I loved the soundtrack. I think I cranked up the soundtrack every day and I listened to it from uh, start to finish. I mean, I, I loved how the soundtrack was, but the musical score was just as a whole, again, very average. I gave it a six out of 10, honestly. I felt like it was very cliched, stuff that we've heard before, just different rhythm, different percussion, just trying to change it up. I, after watching it again, I'm like, meh. Eh, mm -hmm. maybe it's because I have such high expectations. I mean, you want to talk about great soundtracks or like great musical scores. The Last of the Mohicans um, is a great example of Backdraft is a great example. But like, and I'm not expecting this to be on the same level, but I just feel like it's just like, eh, we're the, doing the this just is, because we're, we're going to bring it. People are going to buy this movie anyway. Who cares about the soundtrack? Right. And that, I mean, that was the marketing campaign they had back then around the time that they made this movie. Um, you know, it was really marketed towards like kids and whatnot, which, um, you know, we'll go into the story too later about how I feel Godzilla really didn't do too much. But to on on top of that, though, what was interesting to me when you're when you're bringing up the score and the music, um, you want something for a monster movie, especially like one of like a giant monster mm -hmm. to be more epic sounding. Yeah. 
right? But like all we had was like action. Like it more it felt the movie's direction felt like more it was like about the military sometimes, and it really did feel about Godzilla. Yep. And you know, Godzilla was kind of like almost the side character in this whole thing. I um, I agree. People would say that was the same thing about 2014. But honestly, I think it was just the buildup that they were focusing on, which I thought was great. What they did in 2014 was phenomenal. 1998 was like, eh, really? Yeah, I mean, let's and let's not get it twisted too. In Godzilla movies, there are human characters. I mean, in the Japanese versions of the movie, there are human characters that are interacting. In some in some movies, they're actually one of the better parts of the movie because yeah. the Godzilla cheese just kind of melts off somewhere. So yeah, uh, yeah, you know, I so. Let's not, you know, let's not, uh, let's call a spade a spade and say that definitely um, there, are, there needs to be human characters within your Godzilla film. Of course. Uh, but, you know, the focus that, that all wanes, it all depends. I think you need those people to move the story forward to even oh. care about the stakes. Absolutely. So uh, moving on to CGI and special effects, okay? <laughs> Another six out of ten, okay? When I watched it in theaters, oh, I loved it. Watching it now, it's like, this is terrible. It's absolutely cheesy. I mean, I first things first, like calling it like it is, Godzilla looks stupid in that movie, okay? I think they tried to go too much into a wow factor, but honestly, Godzilla doesn't need more wow factor. Godzilla is the wow factor, okay? You don't need to change him just to appeal to younger generations, really. Yes, they changed him in the 2014 and the, and the uh, uh, most recent one, but he was more to the original Godzilla looking actually. He was like very thickish, should I say. But thing was, is they he was dummy thick. It, it, it was dummy thick, but thing is like that was like what we the fans of Godzilla re re recognized Godzilla as. But they turned Godzilla into a giant iguana essentially because that, you saw at the beginning mm, of the movie. Right, that's what it, they did. They yeah. they took a giant iguana and nuked it and there you go, Godzilla. Yep, yeah, and there's Godzilla. It's like, "No, that's not how it works. That's that's the dumbest thing ever." I mean, let alone the fact I'm like, when you're watching a Godzilla movie, what's the one thing that he does? He destroys the shit out of towns. Godzilla went out of his way to avoid hitting buildings. Godzilla doesn't give a damn, okay? Godzilla is wrecking shop, and mm -hmm. Godzilla really didn't wreck too much shop in there. I mean... Yeah. Well, Godzilla, we're going to say Zilla, because they changed the name of this Godzilla, because Toho bought the rights to, Z to Godzilla two or 1998, and then changed his name to Zilla. So that Godzilla is forever known as Zilla. So I guess we could say Zilla versus Godzilla. That, that sounds good. Yeah. It, but it's like, it, that's my whole entire point, though, is like this Zilla is just like, it, to me, it's like the Jared Leto of Jokers, essentially. <laughs> it's just a trickster in true form. It, I, I can't stand it, honestly. And uh, it's like I said, you know, Godzilla is just there to wreck shop. Godzilla does not care about collateral damage. This was like, oh, excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to crash in this building. Excuse me. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it doesn't make any sense. It it really doesn't. So now now here's where it does make sense. Um, so for one, I actually like the creature design. The problem is you attach Godzilla to the name of it. Mm -hmm. If you would have made this a monster movie, right? And and this will tie into the story, so we'll, we'll get there. Um, but when you make a monster movie and and you label it as Godzilla, you have to live up to that expectation. But if you had you made this a monster movie about this creature that's created from like you know basically from the radiation, right? Yeah. And it's just it doesn't know. It's just trying to survive, just like us. And, you know, it doesn't mean any, it's not really trying to make anybody harm, har, mean anyone harm. It's just there to lay its eggs and, it, you know, it's just trying to survive, right? And then we kind of got like more of like a King Kong kind of feel out of this monster movie. Yep. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, OG, oh, like Peter Jackson's King Kong, I'm talking. Like when Ugh. it gets to the new world, it's killed. And, oh, you don't like Peter Jackson's King Kong? Well, I guess we can fight about that someday. But <laughs> uh, regardless, um, like that kind of feeling like oh there's this there's this creature and it's just trying to figure out it doesn't know what to do it's in a whole new environment and then i would understand the motivation but to have behind it running all the time yeah and it going to all these different places yeah um and laying its eggs and then how it got killed and how it was so susceptible to missiles you know yep. which we can talk about that in the yep. story as well because that's gonna break hearts but yeah i think you're definitely right it looked like trash the cgi looked horrible Practical effects actually didn't look bad. I mm -hmm. give props to the practical effects. The, the puppets and the baby. Yep. The baby Zillas. Yeah, they looked that right. part of it doesn't bother me, so. Yeah, the baby Zillas was actually a pretty cool part of the movie, but yeah. the big one, lame. Very lame. All right, acting and voice acting. I give it a 3 out of a 10, okay? Simply put, I mean, Matthew Broderick fits the definition of a bookworm, but this is not his movie, okay? I mean, 
the best movie I've ever seen Brad, Matthew Broderick in was Glory. I mean, he owned that movie. He did a great job with it. But a movie like this, no. At, no, it's... It, stop it. Stop it. This movie sucks. I mean, holy crap. I mean, just like the acting was terrible. The, the, the chemistry between him and his girlfriend was very awkward and creepy. And Hank Azaria was there for the comic relief. That's all there really is to it. But like that scene where he's got the video camera up and Godzilla's about to step on him and he's like, ah! like screaming. It's like, it, it's so fake. And I don't know what the hell they were thinking. I think they knew this movie was going to tank so badly. So they tried to appeal to Siskel and Ebert and they made Ebert the mayor of New York City, which I thought was like the dumbest thing. I, uh, that's, I'm going to the story, but it's like. None of the characters, like, Jean Reno was the only real saving grace in the movie, but that's just because he's Leon the Professional. But yeah, he right. was like, he was the only actor that I could actually buy into, and his scenes were actually kind of funny, but it was not enough for the, to save the rest of the acting in this movie. It just was, like, cringy at best to, you know, even consider, like, how bad the lines are delivered and how awkward the casting was. And this one line, it's like, oh... That's what he's doing in New York. He's nesting. It's like, you mean there's oh. another one out there? He's like, no, not if he reproduces asexually. It's like, well, where's all the fun in that? <laughs> God. Ugh. Right, because you know what? I could have wrote a better plot twist for this movie. They kill the they kill the one Godzilla, then they stumble across the eggs, and then realize that there was another one. Yeah. Boom. You know, like how the eggs get laid. We probably killed it. Boom, there's another one. They made it. Yep. Duh, dumb, best plot twist. Would have made a movie at least or gave it a bump in a one direction for me yep. and overall. Um, but let's go talk about acting. So, uh, you know, Ferris Bueller, stay home. Yeah. Um, Reno, Reno, yeah, makes the movie. I mean, in, in certain parts. I mean, especially towards the end when they're like, they're fighting them in the uh, the, the smaller ones in Madison Square Garden. Yep. Yeah, was it was? Yeah, Madison, yeah, Square, Madison Garden. Square Garden. Yep. Yep. I mean, it was it was fantastic. Now, here's a good, here's a good point of how bad the like the writing and acting was in this movie at points so there they are you know like there's this because we have to talk about audrey who is um who is nico which is dr nico Tatopoulos or whatever his name is yep. Tatopoulos. Tatopoulos, uh, yeah. That, it's his girlfriend and she's like a newscaster so she has to go and like her arc of this whole story is like she needs the big scoop you know whatever yeah and what does she do they, they're filming with, with Nico at the end inside a mass square garden. And and here's here's Matthew Broderick. And instead of saying like, hey, these creatures need to be killed. And this is why I mean by if this wasn't a Godzilla movie, it was strictly about like a King Kong kind of thing. I could yep. get it. I could get why you're saying, you know, you're calling these creatures beautiful or you know, you're talking about them like in a National Geographic yep. sense. Again. But for this movie it made no damn sense. There they are. They're doing a full news broadcast. There's little Godzillas running around trying to eat them. And, um, you know, you have like um, Reno who's just looking around the blinds like this is like this is taking way too long. Why are we doing this scene? Yep. And uh, and like dialogue in that whole portion is so bad they're because they're for talking. Food. No right. shit, they're, Sherlock. <laughs> right. Exactly. They're looking for food. Look, they're trying to find a way out and they'll replace us as the new dominant life form on this planet. And they're talking about it like it's a cool thing. Yep. It's like, no, like, like really the broadcast should be like, here they are. Yeah. Godzilla and them had babies. Anyway, listen, guys, We're Madison here Square at Garden, Madison Square it. Garden, blow this place to shit, please. Right. Yeah. I blow mean, it up. But no, they have to go into this extra, extra long monologue just for wow, dramatic factor, but it misses on all counts. God, it's just, ugh, <laughs> God, terrible. That, right. And I think that part right there simplifies all of the acting in, in in one little scene right there you just you have you have reno going oh my god i i'm at least i'm getting paid for this as he's looking through the windows yep. um and then you have uh you know you have audrey and nico here and they're just over explaining stuff that we we don't care about because obviously we get it yep and uh that's it really it's all you need to know and then of course an already convoluted plot that they're talking about basically nothing at this point point. and speaking of which we're on the story a two out of ten okay two out of ten Godzilla does not need a plot. Godzilla goes wherever the hell he wants to, okay? But the thing is, with the 2014 movie, he actually had a plot because the Mutos were on the move, and he was basically the check and balance between the worlds. Now, granted, I know they're trying to make Godzilla the hero in those movies, which, but it made sense. They actually added that up. And with King of the Monsters, once again, he was the checks and balance right there between all the monsters right there. And But that made sense. This one... It made no sense. First things first, of all cities to go to, why New York City? It's and, and the thing is, like, when he says, New York's the perfect place to hide. No, it's not. 
There's no. seven million people living I in New York City. Yeah, right. Seven million people living in where the hell is this? For some reason, they were able to make God Zilla or the Zilla fit in the freaking sewer uh, subway systems, and it's like, oh, there's nothing here. There's nothing at all. Stop it. Stop it. This is uh, absolutely atrocious. That they really could have done a better job. I mean, for all we know, the Zilla just could have come up and was trying to murk the entire city. But no, Godzilla came to New York City to nest. Zilla could have mm. could have nested on the same Galapagos Islands, wherever the hell it came from, but it chose New York City. Right. And you got to think about that, too. This thing came from the Galapagos to New York. Think about the land barrier there for yes. a second, right? And how I get it took that. For one, why wouldn't it just nest somewhere in the out there? Like, there, because even if it went to, let's say, like that area, right? Like it went to, you know, the northern, northeastern part of the United States. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't it just pick somewhere like out in the wild somewhere to nest? Good question. And why did like nobody? Why did nobody notice that this thing was in Madison Square Garden at any point? Because it was it was underground, moving around, but like no one checked on Madison Square Garden during all this. Like no one walked in one day and was like, "Oh yeah." Well, shit, the thing the is, like, you, you can hear all the tremors. You you can't hear no tremors inside of Madison Square Garden. Don't they have a janitorial staff? <laughs> where did the jan where the janitors go? <laughs> right. Like I know you evacuated the city, but I mean, like, let's be real. I mean, in, in light of the whole COVID crisis, some people are still going to be considered essential. My dad's garbage man. You know, they didn't cut. They didn't get rid of him. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Like, if some people are going to still be around and you're telling me, like, they're not seeing that. Yep. Let's be real. For all Let's we know, real. the janitor could have been the one to say, hey, they're here. Madison Square Garden, come nuke this place. But right. yeah, I just... yeah, there you go. Say, but that would have saved that would have made the movie less convoluted because then we would have had we wouldn't have had Reno and, uh, you know, Ferris Bueller come in and be like, oh, hey, guys, they're in here. And they would have like the funny, which I, I got to give entertainment value credit where it's due. You know, some of the scenes with the baby um, Zillas are funny. Yeah, and I, I enjoyed it. at least made it, even though it was out of tone for the film. I still enjoyed. Them. Well, I think one of the most most poignant things that somebody pointed out though, like was a critic, was like the fact that got that the Zilla could take, um, take five steps and be across the city in, like in two minutes, but yet can't catch a taxi. Yeah, <laughs> I mean right. that's it's just like one of those suspense fillers they have to put in there. But it's like no, that the logistics does not make sense there. I mean, you mean to tell me that a giant freaking Zilla can't catch one cab? A cab oh, that's oh. going 20 miles per hour in, oh, in and New also York it's, City? Oh, and also, it's rage. Let, let's be let's real about this, too. It's rage. It's pissed off. Mm -hmm. it, you just nuked its babies. Mm -hmm. And and you're like, you're, it's going to just jog now? You know, yep. even though we have seen it outrun helicopters earlier, oh, it's going to yep. jog now. It's just going to jog after you guys. Yeah, it's a quick run in place. That's okay. No big deal. No rush. No rush whatsoever. It's okay. We're, we're cool. Right. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't make any sense. The, the, whole plot of, the whole plot of the movie is is essentially this. Um, mutated lizard goes to a place that it shouldn't even have gone to in the first place to lay its eggs. You know, it's very convoluted from the start. Um, we have a we have a love interest story which they have no chemistry whatsoever not even just physically but also like mentally i mean sh like audrey and and nico are the la last last two people on earth that should get together it, it, i don't it, understand it they, their relationship should have ended they did not act ended. like they did not act like college sweethearts they acted like they just met on tinder for crying out loud so right and then she even used him to get the story and then <sighs> you know and then she's like oh nick i'm i'm i'm, I'm not so actually sorry. I'm so sorry, Nick. I just wanted, yeah. Well, anyway, that like that should have been from Rip. I would have been done with her from Rip. I'm like, okay, that's it. It's over. Right. Um, before yep. before we go into uh, the bottom of the hour, uh, I'm gonna get my final score. Uh, this movie's gonna get a four out of a ten. Okay, below average, really, really bad. It's just, ugh, we've exp I've explained it all. I've I've said my piece. What do you got, Devin? I got a five out of ten, and it's just gonna be for a little nostalgia factor because I was like really young when I saw this movie, so there's a little bit of love there. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a movie that I will revisit from time to time just to watch it again, just to be like, oh, you know, like when I when I was a kid again. But at the same time, like I acknowledge that this movie it really is an average. It's like a low five. It's not an average movie. It's below average, and probably. Um, I wouldn't recommend a lot. Like it's like one of those like one and done. So that's how I say it. Watch yeah. it once for the experience of seeing it, and then don't. Yeah, it, I've seen plenty, kind of like Sharknado, right? Watch it <laughs> once and then that's it. So, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and take a three and a half minute break. Uh, go ahead and go to use the bathroom. Go do what you got to do. Top off on your favorite beverages right there. Uh, we'll be back after three and a half minutes.
Hi, I'm Gary Glarden, the host of No Bones About It, the dog training and behavioral show. Come and listen every Monday and Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time over on Podbean. We go over everything from basic training to advanced behavioral problems. And remember, on No Bones About It, we don't just train dogs, we train humans. Are you looking for a new podcast to listen to? Do you want someone who can provide you more meaningful content? Well, I have something for you. An idea for a good podcaster for you to listen to. Listen in. For all things entertainment, tune in to Niner every Saturday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Pod. For all rant-based topics where the truth has no bias, check out Death of Perspective on YouTube and Pod. For topics where idiots get put on blast, check out Tighten Your Shot with your host, Alex Kirsch, on YouTube and Pod. This podcast is in association with 365 Broadcasting. Feel free to check out our website at www.365lifebroadcasting.com. The truth starts here. Welcome to the Alex Kirsch Project. Well, what are you waiting for? Let's move out. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. If you haven't done so, go ahead and hit like, hit share, hit subscribe to my channel. If you haven't done so already, feel free to go over to Devin's channel as well. Devin, where can they find you at? Uh, you guys can find us on Facebook, um, Bridging the Gap. Uh, we'll have a nice little Bridging the Gap logo there. Uh, two sides, like a yellow piece of fence, or not fence, a bridge, and uh, blue letters in the middle there, Bridging the Gap. Um, you can find us on YouTube as well, Bridging the Gap YouTube channel. And also, if you would, check out Media to Media on Facebook for uh, media needs and all that jazz. Fantastic. All right, so Devin's going to lead us into our next movie we're going to talk about. All right, so the next movie on the agenda here is Kick-Ass. Now, Kick-Ass is essentially the story of a guy who is given quote-unquote superpowers, and he begins to fight crime with no real reason to do so. Um, it's a kind of a gritty piece that talks more so about, um, you know, if superheroes were real kind of thing, but more on like a vigilante level. Um, and that's pretty much the plot synopsis of the movie. Awesome. Or the synopsis of what it is. Yeah, I, I did not watch it until... Uh... A friend of mine had it on an external hard drive when I was in Afghanistan, and I watched mm. it, and I was taken back by it. Actually, I, you know, we'll we'll kind of get into like uh, how I felt about certain parts about it, but it, it it was a pleasant surprise to actually watch it though. So, um, why don't you go ahead and start us off with the uh, with how you feel about like uh, certain parts of the movie? So, uh, cinematography first. Yeah. So, cinematography wise. There were interesting scenes in it that were shot in interesting ways. Um, you know, there's the there's there's one scene where we have our uh, the Owl Man figure uh, go through Bat Dad. and Bat Dad, yeah, the Owl. He I call him the Owl Man figure because he looks like his costume, everything looks like Owl Man. But yeah, or Big Daddy. Um, that's, that's what his Big Daddy. That's what it was. Yeah, Big Daddy. Right. So Big Daddy, he comes in with like you know like a shotgun and, and like it's it shows what had happened in the previous scene whenever we jump back. So it was a nice way of like shooting the scenes yes. in sequence. 
Um, and he's like goes through and just starts shooting all the people in there. And you kind of get this like slow mo action, but also like hardcore kind of like fight scene that breaks down everything that happened. Um, and also too, towards the end, like the action sequences in this film are phenomenal. I oh, think. Yeah. Uh, um, when we have the little girl with the uh, uh, butterfly girl. knives, hit girl, she comes through swinging those things around. And then, you know, the bazooka, I mean, it, it's, it's over the top fun. A lot of the shots in this are over the top fun. And there's also parts that are a little more tamely shot, but they yeah. didn't need to be. They didn't need to be over exuberant. You know, they were, yeah. they were the shots that you needed. And um, it's sort of cohesive narrative. So cinematography wise, if I was going off your rating system, you know, I'd probably give it an eight out of 10. I liked it. I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10 just because some of it looked a little eh. But the thing is, though, like you said, you, you already hit the two main scenes that I loved absolutely. Like, one of the scenes, actually, that you missed was where um, in the movie, um, Kick-Ass is, like you said, is the kid that uh, become gets superpowers. But we're going to cover that. Well, him and uh, Big Daddy get captured by these criminals because they're busting up this drug ring. And <gasps> Hit Girl comes to save them. That entire scene is beautiful because you see it from a first-person view, right? And the thing right. is, you're so used to seeing those action movies where, like, they never run out of ammo, but it actually shows her running out of ammo and shows her tactically reloading. I mean, granted, most NVG devices don't look like that, but the thing is, I don't mm -hmm. care. It's it's fun to watch still. But just right. the entire sequence of events and, like, um, I'll, I'll get into the score in a second. Like, uh, that'll be the next one. But it's just that entire scene is fun flawless in my opinion to me that's exactly how movies should be done like you feel like you're a part of the action and you, you just the intensity you just feel like the intensity is there and right. one scene I mean, and, and like in that scene where she actually uh straps a strobe light and the guys like can't see because it's pitch black in there is completely accurate like i don't mm -hmm. know if you've ever been in a room with those strobe lights like that you can't see shit like it is disorienting so it makes sense and uh i I think that cinematography was great. At times, it was a little hokey, I think. But the thing mm -hmm. is, like, those scenes are what made it. I mean, the the Big Daddy the scene. Ambition. Yeah. The Big Daddy scene where he's just going to the warehouse, just marking guys left and right. Oh, God, I love that scene. <laughs> I, go ahead. No, I was just saying, yeah, I'm, I'm laughing in glee because I, I, I it's so awesome. It's a badass scene. I love it. Oh, it's um, so amazing. And I'm actually sad that you brought that scene up and I hadn't remembered it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can't believe I did not remember the scene where it's one of my we favorite have, scenes where that, that scene because it is it, it's so it's so interesting because of uh, like you said like the perspective reminds me a little bit of Hardcore Henry. Um, Hardcore Henry is one of my kind of like uh, guilty pleasure movies where yeah, it's just interesting because you're in that first person perspective the whole film, mm -hmm. but also to not just the first person perspective but just the different ways that they use the lighting in that room. Yeah. you know, like to be as almost like a weapon, the darkness because usually when the lights go out in a movie and it's dark, you know that that action sequence only plays out for a few seconds but yeah. then in this movie it plays out like for a, for a solid minute we're like yep. we're like what's going on and it's just it's awesome it's badass um, oh definitely. absolutely all right uh next is musical score oh yeah so musical score wise i i enjoyed the music um you know like some of the some of the music choices were really fun that like because again this is a movie that doesn't take itself too seriously at points so like you know when you have like the song where she's like going through and it's like a i can't remember what the hell the song is but it's like almost like a japanese like uh um i don't know like it's like la 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 la, la. like you oh know, you're talking kids. about don't uh, uh, don't give a damn about my next generation da, 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 da. yeah i know what yeah, song you're no, talking about yeah that one no no but there's a song in it i i, I can't remember but it's like it's like it's like like, oh yeah, I, I know what song you're talking about now. Okay, it's it's where she goes and she kills like uh, the drug dealers to save Kickass, mm -hmm, right? Right. Yep. Yeah, and it's like and it's like this like just like this like um, kid music almost. Like yeah. if you're watching like the Doodle Bops or something. Yes. Um and and like it, it's enjoyable just because you're like, what am I watching? Like it, <laughs> it's a what the, and that's good though. That was a good intro I think with the music and her doing all that to kind of like establish who she is mm -hmm. because you know like you have this like little girl character and the expectation is, and it's like, instead of like, you know how like you'd see a little girl like playing with the hula hoop, she's like slicing people's throats and stuff. Yep. And like being crazy, but then you have this music playing. And I think it was a, a nice contrast. I like oh, yeah. it. I'm going to give it an eight out of 10 because they had a lot of good uh, music in there. But my favorite one is once again, when Hit Girl saves the big daddy, that music. Okay. This, the song from there, it's a twist on, um, uh, I think it's a Diago and D minor, which was from the movie sunshine. It's kind of a twist on that uh, song, but I love that song. Period. But the thing is, like, I love it. Like, whenever Hit Girl comes in, she's in the schoolgirl outfit and she's looking for her mom and dad, and they bring in uh, the good and the bad and the ugly. Like, 
Oh, oh, dun, 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 dun. And it just, it just shows her squaring off against these dudes. But like, you really feel like you're a part of the action, though. And like you said, like uh, the la 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 la. I mean, it, it's juvenile, but the thing is, it fits. It, it goes with that entire fight scene right there. And I think that's what they did a really good job with is like, and the one was like where Kickass actually makes his debut by the Chemical Brothers. That song, I've actually been in clubs in Germany when that song was playing, and I'm telling you, man, that place goes nuts when that song was going off. So mm. definitely, like when I heard that, it fit, it fit the profile for that fight scene right there. And so I thought they did a great job with this. So I, I got to give it an eight out of ten. Very appropriate. So yeah, very good. I love, I love the music in it. Uh, CGI special effects. What do you got? Um. I mean, nothing like special, I think, in this in the department of CGI and special effects. Um, you know, I don't think it's like out of this world. Um, there's parts that I enjoyed um, in the CGI special effects department. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you, like, the, like for instance, the the, the jetpack. Yeah. Whole, whole scene with the jetpack. <laughs> I, the love the the jet I love right. the jetpack. I love the jetpack. I mean, because it was so out of, but like, again, this movie is so gleefully fun. It is. And, and if whenever you see the jetpack come in like whenever you whenever you first see it like they're going to go take down the boss of the movie and you're like oh this is gonna be dope and then you see the like the jetpack is just the uh, that's all i can say but yep. i mean like in terms of the look of the cgi i mean, nothing's like spectacular but it doesn't need yeah. to be you know yeah. so you know like i can't really say like it's good or bad per se it's just it does the job it does what it needs to do yeah. um, which is good if you know if, if your cgi is not distracting me from the movie then yeah. you've done a good job on your cgi that's my opinion I gave it a 7 out of 10 because the CGI does look a little cheesy at times, but the thing is, it doesn't rely on the CGI to be good. It relies upon everything else, which I think is important. The CGI, the wow factor can be there, but the thing is, though, it's not necessary. But it looked like, for example, when they, they stuck that dude in that one room and they were cranking up the heat in there and his head exploded, mm. it looked really just, oh, come on, really? But the thing is, though, it doesn't need that. I mean... They probably could have gone with, like, practical effects for that. But honestly, I think they just wanted to go for the, um, the craziness of it all just to kind right, of, like... Uh, over the top. I mean, that's what this movie, re this movie really is. It's yeah. really but the jet over pack, the top. The jetpack, I love the jetpack scene just because it's so ridiculous. I mean, it's kind of like watching the Expendables all over again of how ridiculous it is. But the thing is, it's fun, though. So, I mean, it's not the best special effects. But the thing is, like I said, I mean, it didn't need the special effects to be great. But I I'm going to give it a solid mm. 7 out of 10. So, um... Acting, voice acting. Okay, so um, let's talk about this. So um, our, our, we could go through the casting list here real quick, and I do go need for to pull it. these people up because I haven't watched this movie in a long time. I go for but, it. Uh, so, so Aaron Taylor Johnson here, who's playing our main character, Kickass, yep. um, is I think I think he plays the character very well. Oh yeah, um, he fits this. He fits he fits the mold of the story really, which is like this awkward kind of Michael Sarah character mm -hmm. who's trying to. You know, he basically becomes a superhero all because he gets a superpower, which we'll talk about here is his superpower, his superpower, I say in quotations, is that he can't really feel pain yeah. all that much. You know, he, 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 how, I forget how much he, it was a reduction. Yeah. Because eventually he does feel pain. Yeah. I mean, he says that, but I mean, he, so he can take beatings, but he, his nerve because, endings are damaged. So, right. So, so he can take beatings, but that's what his superpowers. He can just keep getting back up and fighting people. So like they'll punch him and most people would just go down from the hit. They would hit him with. And he's like, no. And he keeps fighting and he works out. And, and again, he starts playing around trying to be a superhero for clout essentially. Yeah. Um, and then that's where we read big daddy and hit girl. And let's say hit girl here. Is that Dakota Fanning? No, that's her name is uh, Chloe Moritz. Chloe, Chloe Moritz. Chloe Moritz. Yeah, no, Chloe Moritz is fantastic in this movie. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I love her to death. Fantastic character. Yep. She she her her whole portrayal of like this badass little girl who like literally knows more than our main character, you know, mm -hmm. kick ass. Yep. Like is a better better badass than he she is. She makes him look like shit. So Yeah, it makes him look like trash. I mean, and Big Daddy too, yeah. But Big I mean Daddy. If I if I were to say it, I'd say everybody did a great job of it. I mean, for crying out loud, Aaron Tyler Johnson did a great job in the movie of playing the geeky kid who just wants to be accepted, but he loves he loves superheroes, and he finally gets the chance to be a superhero. He he talks about how he wants to be like Wolverine essentially. Um, but Chloe uh, Moretz did a great job in it. I mean, she's like twelve, and like she's just calling people like the c word, and she's just 
being mm-hmm. vicious in there. But Nicholas, yeah. this is probably my favorite Nicholas Cage movie. I know it sounds ridiculous because he really, because Nicholas Cage is like he's I, I, comparatively speaking, he's hardly in this movie. You know, he's hardly. In this, but the thing is, though, he actually does a good job of playing the hermit dad that's out for revenge. He plays that part perfectly because, like, when you see him, he looks like a, a scroungy alcoholic kind of guy. But then, like, you see him flip a switch, and he's completely just batshit crazy. I think it's a badass fits. at the same time. It, he's a badass, though. And the thing is, his character makes perfect sense. Like, they draw inspiration from Kick-Ass, but they do a better job than Kick-Ass does. And, you know, mm. obviously, you know, like, then you've got, um, what's this called? Uh, uh, McLovin, uh, Christopher mm. Mintz Plasse. Yeah, right. Great, he did a great job in the movie, too. I mean, of course, he just, rem- it's like McLovin only in the superhero and, uh, Oh God, mm-hmm. I'm trying to I'm trying to think of the the, the main yeah, bad guy. A trash. He's a trashy. He's a kind of like a a rich kid. He's a spoiled rich kid. And he's trying to be cool, and he's actually looking for friend. Like the characters, like the, all the characters have realistic motivations yeah. for the universe that the movie oh, sets sure. up. They all have realistic motivations. I mean, like he ends up he's trying to be the villain, but he actually wants friends, and he's like you can't kill Kickass. Then he realizes he's in a world where he kind of has to be because his yeah. dad is this big crime boss. Yeah. And, and Mark um, Strong, yeah, love Mark Strong. He did a great job playing like the, just like the bad guy. Frank. Yeah, oh, yeah, Frank D'Amico. Uh, D'Amico, yeah. It's just, I think the acting was great. I'm giving the acting a solid 9 out of 10, honestly. I thought everybody did a great job of it, especially like the part where Kick-Ass goes in to stop Razul to tell him to stop picking on his the, the girl. And he's like, I'm Razul. And the girl, like, she starts, like, grabbing her chest and things like that. And he's like, because, ah, like, that's one of his <laughs> biggest fantasy. Like, he did that part so well. So... Right. Yeah. No. I mean, and like I said, the 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 style, the tone, everything. Yeah. I mean, the acting is fantastic, and I I would give it a nine out of ten as well in terms of acting, just for the universe it sets up, and everybody oh, yeah. does their part. And good direction, I think, in this oh, movie. Yeah. Great direction. Uh, story. Story. Story is fantastic to me too. I actually genuinely enjoy it. Now, were there parts where like you know you you kind of wish there's a little bit more action? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I mean, the movie is wacky, but it's also at the same time realistic. Yeah. It's kind of a brutal, realistic superhero movie because it's saying superheroes exist, but they're mortals. You know, mm-hmm. they're not like super magical yep. fairies with superpowers. Up, but they're just people that are really ripped and badass and know mm-hmm. how to use guns. Yep. And they're fighting crime boss and stuff. And and um, the really the only person who actually technically has a superpower is Kickass. Yep. Because Very he true. has that. He he's numb. He can he's numb to pain, or yep. he's at least resistant to it. Resistant um, to it. Yeah. And everybody else in this movie is like you know they're just badass characters like batman you know? essentially so and and it fits it fits a great tone as we're as we're talking through the progression of the plot where we have someone like nicholas cage who he's trying to get revenge on the family because I, i'm trying to remember ex- the exact motivation didn't uh it, it, his, Nico... his, yeah his his wife was killed by them uh by the drug by the drug right and the, and the police but but he worked for as a police officer and they yep. failed to follow yep. up on the case because exactly. they're being paid by D'Amico, so he became a vigilante. Exactly. And that, that story has believability. Nicolas Cage's um, relationship to his daughter, because he's so crazy and demented, he literally brings his daughter and makes her into a weapon. Yep. Um, which is also insane in and of itself. But again, the, the story plays off in a fun kind of way, but it does have dark moments. I mean, the part wherever like kick ass and uh, Big Daddy get captured and you know they're getting tortured. Like you're really feeling for the characters. Like I felt more, and it was, you know, it's like an action comedy movie, but I really felt emotions. Yep. as this was going like i had like uh, one thing your story has to do for me in terms of being a good movie and we'll mm-hmm. talk about the also with uh you know i mean uh, no country for old men mm-hmm. um you have to be attached to your characters yep. if, if if i can't if i don't then your story's failed yeah you now your story's failed i'm gonna give it an eight out of ten but i'm gonna explain why okay when i first watched i thought it was gonna be a comedy from start to finish right so i was expecting mm-hmm. it to be a comedy like from the time like the first scene where the guy is pretending to be like a superhero and he tries to fly and he just smashes into a freaking car i was dying laughing i was just rolling but then like the part where kick-ass and big daddy are captured right i was like wow this is getting a little serious right here and then when he's doing the whole self-narration thing and he's like trying to break the fourth wall he's like and if you're reassuring yourself that i'm talking to myself that i'm still alive don't be a smart ass didn't you ever watch uh, american beauty i was like i love how they really just kind of added that in there because Mm -hmm. It kind of like leaves you the hope. It's like, oh my God, these guys are going to live. But then he's like, don't be a smart ass. Didn't you ever watch American Beauty? I love how he just kind of broke the fourth wall right mm-hmm. there into doing that. And yeah. the only reason why I kind of you know downgrade is just because it was the stereotypical 
you know, in a way like the revenge portion was thrown in there. And mm -hmm. I felt like it kind of gets overused at times, but it, it was appropriate. I just felt like it was a little overdone at times. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. There, there are times like when I felt, felt like it, it kind of was like, eh, just kind of like, you know, like the part with like him and the girlfriend. I know that uh, Katie is like his big love interest right there, but I think mm -hmm. it, it seemed just a little bit rushed and a bit hokey, I think. but Right, yeah. right. That whole thing. I mean, which it did add comedic elements. Don't get yeah. me wrong. Him and his girlfriend's affair had – had comedic elements to it. Yeah. But there was a part of me that like, if maybe they'd spent more time developing the character, like if they just got rid of the girlfriend thing yep. and it, spent it, more time developing him and maybe his relationship to big daddy and hit girl. Yep. I would have enjoyed that more. I, I think that makes perfect that. sense too. So, um, because the comedic possibilities would have been yeah. be good, if not better with hit girl, big daddy and him mm -hmm. versus hit the girlfriend where like, he's like, you know, like, are you gay? And like, he's like telling him that she's, he's gay and all this other stuff. Like that would have been so much better. Yeah. Um, the big daddy hit girl situation. Yeah. yeah so of course. much better. So um, let's go with final score. What you got for a bit final score? Final score. This is um, a classic movie to me in terms of if you were, if everyone ever asked me how to make an action comedy movie and do it right and build a world, um, even like even crime movies too, mm -hmm. I would give this a nine out of 10. Um, mm -hmm. It only falls short just because, you know, obviously there's parts where it could be improved upon and it could have done a little bit better. Like it left me wanting in some areas, but it's a fun movie. Like if right. I ever look at someone, I'm like, Hey, let's have some fun tonight for movie night. Right. I'm watching this movie. Yeah. I'm going to give it a solid 8 out of 10 with a kick-ass, no pun intended, seal of approval. Just because of, like, you know, everybody has that imagination of what it would be like to be a superhero. But then it, it's always going to be a gangster until you got to do some gangster shit, right? Like they always say. Mm. Because, like, kick-ass thought he was going to be able to, you know, be a, a, a fighter, a war hero, or something like that. Until he actually gets the shit kicked out of him by all these gangsters. And they were that close to death until Hit Girl came and saved him. It's very real it's very raw i love that part about it and you know like i said i've already mentioned the parts that they could have improved upon it but it's a solid eight out of ten i mean it's a great movie i could watch this movie over and over again and like i said when i like to go back and watch certain parts of movies just that scene where hit girl saves him i watch that you know all the time just because of the music the the, the action and it just it's very appealing to me so um before we go on to the next one, I just want everybody to know we are definitely going to go over an hour, just a little bit, so, but, um, just so y'all can just sit tight real quick. So, um, anyway, so you've given your, uh, vote, and I've given my vote, so, once again, Kick-Ass is a great movie. Glad I, I've watched it. I haven't seen Kick-Ass 2 yet, because I'm scared to watch it, because I heard it wasn't yes! that good. Yes! Yes, same here! Same here! I'm scared, because I feel like what I heard is they got rid of a lot of the elements that made the one good, because now there's, like, an army of superheroes. Yep. Yeah, and I like saw a little gang, bits and basically. pieces of it. It's like, oh, come on. So, yes, yeah, so that's why I'm like, mm, it, it no, took no. away the unique portion of it. So, all right, next. No country for old men, okay? No country for old men. Now, this might be a bit unfair because, unlike the other two movies, this one won all kinds of Academy Awards. It was directed by Ethan Joel Cohen, and it is an absolute, to me, it's a masterpiece. Granted, it's not my top 10 all time favorite movies of all time, but, you know, I love it because it's just that good. So for those that have never seen it, violence and mayhem ensue after a hunter stumbles upon a drug deal gone wrong and more than $2 million in cash near the Rio Grande. All right, this has got a star-studded cast. Tommy Lee Jones plays a sheriff. Javier Bardem plays the... Uh, Javier Bardem plays uh, an assassin. Josh Brolin plays the hunter that comes upon the $2 million cash. Um, Kellen McDonald plays his wife. I mean, we there's... And Woody Harrelson's in it. Just he's in it for just a little short amount of time. Right, but even the scenes where Woody Harrelson's yeah. in it, he he's doing a phenomenal oh, job. He does I a mean, great job. It's Woody every, Harrelson. Yeah, well, not just that. I'm I'm just saying, like every character in this movie, and we'll get to it. But every character yeah. in this movie, they like they all real to me. Like they're all great yep. characters. I don't think I had bad acting in any scene. Uh, th there wasn't hardly any. It was all believable characters, and you know we're we're gonna get to the acting uh, eventually. But here here's the reason. Okay, so. For those that have not seen this movie, first off, why the hell not? Second off, okay, the reason why this movie is just so good is because it's actual good storytelling. Because you do not know what the hell to expect in this entire movie. I'm just going to say that right there from the get-go. Because the first character you're essentially introduced to is Javier Bardem's character, Ch uh, Anton Chigurh. And what he does is he essentially strangles a deputy with his handcuffs because he's detained in a jail cell and he steals the uh deputy's car 
and pulls somebody over and then kills them with a bolt gun that you use to uh, kill animals before you slaughter them, really. I mean, I, I'm okay, we got to get into it, okay? I, I, I'm not going to be able to buy my tongue, okay? So first things first, cinematography, 9 out of 10 easily, okay? The camera angles in this movie is stellar, okay? And here's the reason why. The, the scene that really just opens it up for me, right? It, that really just defines how good the cinematography is, is not just like when uh, Josh Brolin's character, uh, Llewellyn, when he gets chased by the cartel and they sick the dogs after him. I'm talking about when he's getting chased by Chigger, right? Because mm -hmm. Anton Chigger. Because Anton Chigger is a professional. He is a cold, hard assassin, and he fits that profile to the letter, hence the haircut. But the thing is, though, is like what's so good about it is like he chases him out of a hotel window, essentially, and it's like picking him off with a freaking uh, a rifle or a shotgun that has a silencer attached to it, and he's able to just take out people at great distances. But the thing is, though, is like it's just the scenes of where like the guy tries to get in the car and drive away, and Chigger is there with the freaking uh, shotgun, and like you really, there's no music whatsoever, and you <laughs> feel the in the intensity is just oh my god, it's amazing. Like the cinematography, they just like from start to finish, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. They capture mm -hmm. the darkness. There's like the, the eeriness, like there's not that much music in this, but the thing is like the cinematography in it is like, we really feel like you're a part of the action. Just like the scenes in this movie just really grip you. Like you feel the intensity of the scene without the music. I mean, to me, that just defines how good the cinematography is. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, so here's where I'm going to come at you with cinematography. I mean, every scene in this movie, and it's fresh to me because I just seen it today, everybody. So you can roast me at your, at your leisure. Um, the, the, every scene in this movie is meant to build suspense. Uh, 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 scenes stick out to me, like, and that's why there is no music because silence is the greatest suspense builder. Um, I can I can give you so many lists of scenes from the, this movie um, that I've seen. So, for instance, whenever there's this scene where we find the tracking device, right, in, yep. in the money, um, and we'll go before that as well. But right now, whenever um, our, our main character here, uh, Josh Brolin, finds the well, I guess there are no main characters in this movie. Like every character in this movie is there own main character i mean it primarily reminds around revolves around josh Brolin, but you know tommy lee jones and javier are also there for the ride yeah um but but anyway so um we have uh, llewellyn and that's josh Brolin's character he finds the tracking device and then he as soon as he finds it he wakes up and realizes like you know there's a tracking device in the money and that's how the guy's finding finding his location well then we realize that he goes to call the person down front and there's no answer and then he hears footsteps so he already obviously our character's now like uh-oh this dude's here. Yep. So um, Antoine is is like you know roaming the halls and stuff and so on. And our character is like ready to go. He gets his shotgun ready to go and turns out the light in his room. Um, and he looks down at the floor, and then he like you know pulls his trigger because he sees that the guy's feet, Antoine's feet, are at the door. Well, Antoine, being the professional assassin that he is, realizes this, and then he turns out the light in the hallway so that way he doesn't know if he's in front of the door or not yep. it's incredible it is so and 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 we're sitting there and now here's another thing the, the smoking gun um you know if you're ever you watch hitchens film or you know hitchens talk about yep. you know what makes suspense it's like you basically like you put a bomb in a scene yep and uh, you, i know exactly what you're talking about and, and no and you let and nobody's allowed to know well here's the thing we've seen throughout this movie that up until this point that he uses that that air gun that um alex brought up earlier to blow locks off of doors mm -hmm. <clears throat> well we know looking at that door i know he's gonna blow that lock off and our man and i'm sitting there looking at josh bone's character like you like dude you're right in front of the door he's gonna blow that lock off and like yep. it's gonna hit you it's gonna hit you it's gonna and then you know like we're just waiting for it like i literally took my headphones off because i knew it was coming and then punk it comes it hits him he's running away and then it breaks down to that scene where um alex talking about again but another scene is whenever uh bardem antoine right uh javier bardem uh, Antoine, the character. Yeah, yeah. Antoine, yep. Yeah, he comes in and he's. This is the first time he tracks him. And of course, at this particular point, Brolin doesn't know that there's a tracking device in the money. Yep. Um, but he, but he's aware that there's someone after him. So yep. he puts the money up in this vent, and we're this we're is like the first oh. hotel. Yeah. Yeah, the first hotel. He puts the money up in this vent and he hides it, and then he calls the cartel people that are looking for the money. And you know, they actually no, he doesn't call them. He, the nope. people they, that they, are in the, they just come looking for him. So. Yeah, they come looking for him, right? And they have a tracker too, and that that gets into the story, which is kind of we'll yep. get to that point. But 
they come looking for it too. And then of course our character, uh, our assassin character, Antoine goes in, he kills the Mexican characters there. And um, Josh Brolin at this particular point had made an apparatus to get it out from the other vent in the other room across the way. Yep. Because he was almost testing a theory, which yep. is something I liked. Like there was like, this cat and mouse kind of yep. game going on. Yep. And he's a hunter. That was, he, he was thinking like the assassin. He was thinking like they were because he is a hunter. So he would think... 10 steps ahead of them and that's what makes it so believable but anyway uh keep going i'm sorry no no i but but what made it seem so suspenseful because we're talking about cinematography was how it was shot like we see feet we never know they they never show the room numbers so you don't know if if maybe um antoine had already knew that he was in the room on the other side yep because like when he walks up and he's all quiet you're like which room is he going into is he yep. going into room is he going into the room where our guy's trying to get the, the money out yep. or is he going into the room that he already set up what what room is he going to yeah and once he gets there you know or he gets the money out and he leaves and you know that suspense is gone but every single scene even the one where tommy lee jones at the end of the movie which i don't i still don't understand that scene to this day mm -hmm. where antoine is right behind that door mm -hmm. he opens up that hotel room door and he knows he's in that door mm -hmm. And, you know, Tommy Lee Jones could easily just shoot through that door right yeah. there and kill him and then stop this man's mad rampage of murder. But he doesn't. He yeah. just looks over, he sees the scenes, and he says, you know what, I just can't deal with this anymore. Yeah. And that whole scene was suspenseful in itself, too, because you think that Antoine's going to pop out and shoot him, mm -hmm. or you think that uh, Tommy Lee Jones is going to do the same thing, yeah. but none of them do. Yeah. It couldn't I couldn't agree more. So, um, anyway, uh, musical score, okay? There's only 16 minutes, I know because I looked it up, there's 16 minutes of musical score in the entire movie, okay? I give it a 7 out of 10 because it's all appropriate. It's not so much the presence of music, but the lack of presence of music. Because, honestly, if you try to if you try to add music to it, I felt like you would have degraded it. You would have kind of degraded the suspense. There are times when music adds to the suspense and the thrill of the movie. But the lack of music in it actually adds to it. And the music they actually put in there... It's not the greatest, but the thing is, it's appropriate, though. I mean, I, and it might seem a little bit outraged that I'm given, like, even any kind of score. But the thing is, the reason I'm giving it such a good score is because of how appropriate it is. It's nothing special, but the thing is, it's appropriate throughout the entire movie. I mean, that's just how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. right i mean it does its job and and again lack of music is a choice i mm -hmm. think and i think it i think if you're talking about your sound and your score having no music in it mm -hmm. makes it to me anyway good because you need that for your suspenseful film so yep. um you know i wouldn't i wouldn't know if i give it quite as i maybe i give a six out of ten yeah um, just fine. because of its lack but i would say that it's it's just it's good that they left it silent it was a good choice oh sure absolutely uh so going into uh CGI special effects. There really are no CGI slash special effects, okay? But there are practical effects, and the practical effects are amazing, okay? Um, like this, the first hotel scene, right, where Anton is actually seen rehearsing how he's gonna enter a move, enter a movie, because he like he gets the layout of all the rooms, right, and he kind of gets a feel of how each room is laid out, right, and like he tests. You mean George Brolin? No, no, I'm talking about Anton, uh, Chico, okay. the, the the assassin. What he does is, first he tests his room, right? Because he figures his room is the same layout all across the board, right? So what he does is he mm. kicks open, he throws the doors open, and he kicks the light on to test the time it takes for the light to come on and for him to raise his shotgun, right? Then he moves, makes his way down to the room where his target is located at, but come to find out it's not Josh Brolson character, it's cartel members, right? And this scene, like right here, is like where... He, re he does it again where he kicks open the door. or No, he not doesn't kick open. He uses his bolt gun. The lock comes off, enters the door, kicks the light on, and blows a dude's arm off. And you can tell it's a prosthetic arm, but it looks believable. Holy shit, mm -hmm. is it terrifying too. Because the thing is, you can only imagine what the guys in the bathroom were thinking when they heard a door get kicked open and a thunk sound come out and the dude scream and then a thunk sound and then it's quiet again. Mm -hmm. I mean, like right. I said, it's practical effects, and they are executed beautifully. A solid 8 out of 10, just because of, like, how they relied on practical effects to make it work. And I felt like they did a great job with it, honestly. There's, yeah. no, there's no need for a wow factor. The wow factor is the movie itself. I will be a preacher, and this is why I love—okay, um, so a uh, little side note, but John Carpenter's The Thing— 
is one of my favorite movies of all mm-hmm. time. And it's because of the practical effects in that monster movie. And, you know, like there's, cause it looks like it's there. Mm-hmm. And I feel like if you're in a monster movie, um, if you don't have, if, if I don't believe that thing's right there in front of me, I don't care about it. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing that applies here. You know, if you use CGI for some of the, it wouldn't feel real to me to take me out of it. But like, you know, the dead bodies and the Mexican seat, the, the standoff scene where, where Josh Brolin comes across all of the yep. people with that are dead. They all looked gross and, you know, like the trucks that were all shot up looked fantastic. Um, The, when we were talking about that scene, wherever the dog chases him through the water, that whole scene. That's terrifying. Right. Yeah. I love dogs. That's terrifying. Yeah. Like literally the dog doesn't stop following him. Yep. And then he shoots the dog and like the way it just like, even though like for a second, it felt kind of cheese. You, but you're like, wow, like, but they did it. So they executed it so well that I have to, you know, I have to give props where it was due. Like, I'm like, okay, this actually looked like a, not a bad cut. Like the jaw, he shoots, dog jumps, toss it over. And then it goes to like a prosthetic that's like shaking, like the dog shaking, you know, yep. like they make a puppet. They made a puppet of the dog to make, and like, to show us like it's shaking there, like dying Yep. after he shot it. So incredible. Yep. So give it a good rating. Absolutely. All right. So here's the good ones. Okay. Acting, voice acting, a 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. I cannot stress enough. I mean, there's a reason why Javier Bardem won Best Supporting Actor in a role. It's because of how good he did. The thing is, like, with Javier Bardem is, like, he doesn't really like violent movies, but Ethan and Joel Cohen, that's why they picked him. And when they said, well, this will be your haircut, is like, oh, my God, I'm not going to get laid for a year. They gave each other a high five because he looks like a psychopath. But the thing is, what's so different about him is, like, the scene that really defines Javier Bardem, I think it's the one they used for the Academy Awards, was when he was the Texas in the Texas gas station, right? Mm-hmm. And like the guy's like asking him like how things is like uh you get much rain where you from? Is like what business is it of yours where I'm from? And he just turns serial first he's like a non chatty customer, but then he turns serial killer in an mm-hmm. instant, right? The coin flip, right, is brilliant. Because the guy, the, the guy behind the counter really feels like he is about to die. The tension in that scene itself, you could cut it with a freaking knife. It's so it's just, there's so much tension in it right there. And the thing is, he gives a backstory about the quarter. He's like, you know when this quarter was made? 1958. He's been traveling 28 years to get here. It's like, oh my God. Like, I, I literally felt this, this, the hair on my skin on my arms and my back just stand up on end is yeah, just and now it's here and now it's but, here it's yeah just, and i like that it's talking about uh, it's a good um theme about fate yeah because you know it's like it's like there's all every day you know, we choose to live or die basically mm-hmm. and he's like he's like well here it is right now it's, it's a decision you make the call it, it it's it, it's amazing because like he really just personifies that role and the fact that he just really acts like a professional hitman like of course i don't know many very many professional hitman but the thing is how he conducts himself in the entire movie as a professional, right? And how he just, he shows no mercy whatsoever. And the thing is, like, like even with, um, even with, like, uh, what's it called? With uh, um, Llewellyn's wife, like, even he confronts her, and she won't play his game, essentially. And we can all assume he probably ends up killing her, essentially. But the thing yeah. is, like, Tommy Lee Jones did a great job in the movie, too. We don't see him very much, even though he was the highest paid actor in the movie. We don't see him very much. Josh Brolin's character is brilliant. Woody Harrelson's character is brilliant. Everybody just did such a great job. I mean, you believed in the characters. You you grew attached to the characters. You grew attached mm-hmm. even to Chigger because he's the bad guy. But yet you're like, I can't take my eyes off of this dude. Like, he's so compelling, but the thing is, he's dangerous, and he just looked like a dangerous psychopath murderer. He's, he's, a, he's a train wreck, and yeah. you just can't help but look away. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, we can go into several characters here. I mean, you pretty much hit Antoine on the head, um, and he, he struggles a lot, it looks like, with um, order and reality, and that's something that a lot of people, because in a lot of his lines, he basically brings that up. He's, he's uh, you know, you make the decision, you make the call, uh and he he's so adamant about you choosing which side of the coin you're going to pick because you know he's just said he wants to like reestablish order to the world it seems yep. like um and that's kind of that's his thing. analogy kind of, yeah and and the thing is he doesn't have we we kind of infer things about his past because apparently like he says things about like you know like i got here the same way the coin did yep and what he was saying and that and now what he's saying from that that like what he said out of his mouth was you know i was just a flip mm-hmm. that's how i got in this world 
You know, like he doesn't know why. It's almost like a um, a very um, what's the word? Not, not not is it nihilistic? I guess nihilistic worldview. Like you know, like he he's just here. He's like I, I, he doesn't even he's not even in reality. Yeah, he's de- detached himself. Yep. Um, and I think it's a great um, it's a great thing to describe his character, Josh Brolin. We'll talk. I want to talk a little bit about him mm-hmm. because his character is very interesting. He does a great job portraying this hunter character, but also he's flawed in that the sense that he is so obsessed with keeping this two million dollars to change their lives that he literally gets rid of. He he wastes his wife's life, kind of in a sense. Yeah. Um, which is very interesting. It's a good character study because. He's so obsessed with it, you know, and the, this, this murderous Antoine, he even said, he's like, Hey, if you just give me the money and lay it at my feet, I pro I can't promise any harm's not going to come to you. Cause basically saying like, I'm going to kill you. He's like, but he's like, I promise I won't hurt your wife. And you know, it's weird about, um, we actually t- do kind of believe it at this time because Woody Harrelson at this point has already come up to Josh and said, Hey, he's got principles. And we'll talk about Woody Harrelson's character a little bit too. He's, he's the second guy sent to get the money for the um, American side of this drug deal that um, George Bowen had come across to get in the movie. And he was tasked with finding it and finding uh, Antoine, but you know, Antoine is almost offended yep. that this organization had sent someone else. He's like, no, no. He's like, you send the right tool for the job. Yep. You know, and that's why he ends up killing that guy in the end of the movie too. Um, yep. the, the guy at the head of the top um, and Tommy Lee Jones, he does a phenomenal job of portraying this character that He's just not even used. He doesn't. He's he's worn down. Yes. He's trying to figure out how do I even police in a world this crazy anymore? And, you know, the realization at the end of the movie, that's kind of nice, I guess, is like, you know, his, his, um, was it his uncle or someone? It was his dad. His dad says to him that, you know, it's always been this crazy. Yeah. And that was the the end of his dream. It's crazy. Well, it's true though. Like that's exactly the analogy of this movie though, is this like, you know, the world has always been this crazy and there's like you know he's been around a long time and the world has not changed whatsoever and it it definitely applies today if you think about it so it's 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 a really deep dark message right there and just everybody just is completely just flawless across the board i mean just like god i just can't say enough about the acting it's just amazing so Mm-hmm. Uh, and and one last note the side characters too every side character was believable every single oh, one absolutely. and that's impressive so like it's you don't even have like that random character who like just detracts from the story at some point never every oh. single character from the hotel keepers yep. to the random bystanders that get shot to everybody e- is fantastic even the guy like uh that that chigger kills and the, the shower like the dude's just mm-hmm. hanging out in the showers like like you, you could just tell like how petrified he was and like you don't really understand. I can't understand what he was saying, really. But I guess he was saying, "Please don't kill me," kind of deal. Mm-hmm. And you know, he, he's like, he, "I know nothing." He's like, yeah. "I know nothing." Oh, he knows nothing. But it's like he knows that the end is coming right now. But it's just like he just everybody does a great job in that movie. So uh, yes, I agree a hundred percent. The acting is phenomenal. So all right. So story again, a solid ten out of ten. Okay, you don't know where the hell the story's taking you. The story is going a million miles per hour. But the thing is, like. It's moving at a steady pace, but the thing is, there's so much going on at that point, and the I, I just can't begin to describe. Like again, every character has a purpose in that movie, and everybody mm-hmm. executes it properly. Everybody does a great job in the movie, right? Everybody's character is believable, but just the story of it of two million dollars and how it can change an entire city, how it can change an entire life of everybody in the movie. Like you could talk about how it's about greed or it's just about like you know um wanting a better life for yourself wanting a better life for your family and then you got this guy that's coming at just gunning for you and he's not gonna stop he's like the freaking terminator you know he right. does not and it's not stop. even about the money for him yeah it's just because he that's what he does he is the tool i mean it, and the thing is like tommy lee jones is just the guy that's just stuck in the middle and he does mm-hmm. not know what to do about it whatsoever i mean can you imagine any police officer out there today, like in streets, like on the streets where like, like say for example, Chicago where crime happens all the time and you're just weighed down by the craziness that's going on in your town and there's nothing you feel that you can do about it. No matter how many good things you can do, it just isn't enough. Like there's no country for old men. I mean, it's, it says it in the title right there. So again, the, the story is a solid 10 out of 10. I can't say it enough. What do you got? So story-wise for me, um, 
if I would say, yeah, 10 out of 10, but you know, I wouldn't, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to be a little critical here. Mm -hmm. I lied because here, here's my take. Yeah. So I wanted, I, I, I mean, and this is the thing, sometimes it's like one of those things like, is it better for a movie to give you what you want, to give you a conclusion or to leave you hanging? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we really don't get that conclusion. We get, uh, you know, we, we basically get Tommy Lee Jones character who's, who his, his analogy at the end of the movie is basically talking about that he's, you know, the end of his life's coming basically, mm -hmm. you know, and like, that's it. He's, he's worn down. And that's what, that's what he has to look forward to. Cause you know, like, and that'll happen to everybody in our lives is like, yeah. there's, there's like milestones you hit in life. And eventually that last milestone you're going to hit is death. Like you've, you've done it. Yeah. You've done everything you're going to do in life now. Oh yeah. You're tired. You're, the next milestone is the, is the end, right? Um, it's just the passing of the torch. You know, that's what he's basically referring to there is like his dad handed him the torch. Mm -hmm. And then now, you know, he's like, he, he assumes his dad's going to be up ahead for him, but is he? Yeah. And it's kind of the same analogy there. And um, well, then we also get, uh, you know, Chigger, which is interesting because I like I like this um, idea because remember, he likes to be order in this crazy world. Like, you know, Antoine, as this as this murderous character, he, he tries to be this fist of God order um, within the world. And what happens is at the towards the end of the movie, of course, he gets hit by a car yeah. because. I think he and, and he's there he is he's still trying to control everything in his life he tells the kid to give him a shirt he hands him money he says hey don't blab you yep. didn't see me tell him i was already gone oh, but God. how long can he control the world yep. how long can he control everything that happens to him the world is other chaos yep. and it's a, it's it's like we learn in that sense we learn that chigger is almost like he's an old man mm -hmm. in the sense of the ways of the world yep. just like how tommy lee jones is yep. because he's naive to think that he can be an a sense of order in the world whenever you know he is but one man and the world depends on everyone else around him and eventually your luck's gonna run out because it's so crazy yeah uh, and then also i think josh boland's an old man too because you know i think he's naive to think because that's what i think this movie plays a lot with his naivety um and josh boland is he, he's naive to think that he can get away with uh, the two million dollars the two million dollars right and like make a better life for himself and he gets so and so convoluted that or so naive that you know he starts to believe that he can actually kill antoine mm -hmm. now reason why i'm saying all of this is because the problem i have is there is part of me that wanted an ending that was like this three-way showdown mm -hmm. that's where i was getting or even maybe a four-way if woody harrelson would have stuck around yep that would have made for a great thing. I mean, I appreciate them for not going for the cliche of the four-way showdown. Yep. That's been done in a lot of Western films. Yeah. You know, where, but but I, it left me wanting more because they had such great acting that if they had a four-way showdown, it could have been the best four-way showdown scene in cinematic history. It really could have been. It, it could have been, but instead, Llewellyn gets killed by cartels. Uh, Chigger gets taken out by, uh, uh, well, no, he's not really taken out, but he, he gets in a car accident and he escapes. And Tommy Lee Jones pretty much just like, well, that's it. Retires. Yeah, but I mean, but here's the thing about Antoine, because that's like the biggest poignant thing is about the story and his arc is it's like he's still he's still so naive because there he is, an arm that's busted the way it is. Uh -huh. It's not getting repaired. His bone is sticking out. Like you can't just you gotta go to a that hospital. That was hideous. <laughs> right. You have to go to a hospital, dude, or else you're gonna pretty much die. Like if you yeah. snap your bone out of your, like how's your how's your body gonna heal from that? You have a low chance of survival. Yeah. But there he is. He's still to that. He's like, I'm gonna. I'll, you're, I'll you're figure never gonna it know out. what happens to him after that. So, right. You'll ne we never know. But one could only assume that if he was going down the path he was going, he was screwed. So yeah. again, I I liked everyone's arc. I just it left me wanting more. So I'll give it a nine out of ten because it was a phenomenal story yeah. and every scene was a scene of suspense that made you just pet, like your eyes were glued couldn't move away oh yeah so my final score for the movie is a nine out of ten i mean you've you made some good points but the only reason i give it a nine out of ten is just because like like i said the musical score it, it, it was missing it but at the same time i felt it was appropriate but it's just like the nine out of ten it's not because it's it, it's great it's a phenomenal movie like i i know i've said phenomenal quite a few times but i've laid out all my talking points about it i mean you and i've been just like going back and forth about like how good of a movie it is because it just really excels it just oozes just that beautiful cinematic experience that that i feel like a lot of movies are lacking nowadays but then again like the coen brothers did oh brother where art thou they did fargo and those are also great movies but just no country for old men it just there's something about that movie just it makes you want to watch it over and over again and it's just because like i said just the coin flip scene at the at the gas station. Love that movie. Just like it, 
the entire movie as a whole is a masterpiece in my mind. So I, I give right. it a solid nine out of ten. Well, here's where I'm going to probably break some barriers here. Go and, for it. Um, you know, I'm going to give it a 10 out of 10. Okay. Uh, and a lot of people will come at you usually with like, oh, you know, well, there's this and that. But truthfully, there's always, in every film I watch, there's always going to be something that I wish could have been done better. It's a little yeah. nitpicky. But it, but a movie at the end of the day is what it is. And it needs to, and if a movie is a masterpiece, by all means, it needs to get that 10 out of 10 rating for me. Sure. And I have to give it to it. Like, I have to get praise. There's parts where, like I said, I wanted more, but that's not for me to decide. That's an yeah. opinion thing. In terms of execution, in terms of story in terms of everything what it is is a masterpiece and it deserves a 10 out of 10 and if anybody out there i just watched it today if you have not seen this movie go watch it please you you won't be able to take your eyes off the screen from minute two absolutely i couldn't agree more i mean just it's a very fair assessment to say that you know if you call it a masterpiece it's got to be a 10 out of 10 but you know like i said there's just a couple things as to why i drop it down to a 9 out of 10 but honestly it's a, a masterpiece of a movie like i said so but anyway, so that pretty much concludes like all the three different movies that we've talked about right there. Um, you know, we're gonna have to do this again though, because like I, I feel like it, like the hour, and, almost an hour and a half has really just flown by, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, because I, I, it's good. I like talking with people where we can talk in depth about films and movies and you know the themes and everything, which is phenomenal. And I, we will have to do this again because I genuinely enjoy it. And I even. Um, thought about starting doing movie reviews too. I used to do them where I would actually do them like I would go into a movie theater mm -hmm. and I would leave the parking lot and then do a review on the movie right there in the parking lot. Like I'd bring my webcam, pre-record it. We got stopped by a cop one time. It was funny. <laughs> I ended up deleting the YouTube channel because of uh, there was certain content there that I didn't want people to see because I was like a younger, edgier me, you know? So yeah, fair uh, enough. For, so so I, I got rid of some of it and I should have kept those movie reviews, yep. but I got rid of them as well. And But anyway, regardless, um, the... The, I, I love reviewing movies. I love talking about movies. I want to make movies someday. And the, these kind of conversations are great. And again, Alex, thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely, it. man. Uh, the one movie I'm looking forward to, which has also got Josh Brolin and Javier Bardem is, well, like I said, the Dune movie. I can't wait to watch that movie because like, holy crap. Like it, it's my all time favorite science fiction story. So Dune? Dune. D-U-N-E. Yep. Dune. Okay. And that's, uh, is that on Mars? It's not on Mars. Okay. So. Cause um, I'm trying to remember what, when I'll send that? you a link after this. You'll, you'll need to check it out. So, yeah. Cause it's like, is it based on a game? It's not based on a game. No, it's based on a Frank Herbert novel from 1965. Okay. okay. Cause I could have sworn I remembered not doom. I know, I, I know you yeah. might be thinking I'm thinking of doom, but I'm not. I actually thought there was a game. Th there was doom. a game called dune, but you know, it's just, that's a strategic game, but that's a long story. So, but I'll, yeah. I'll send you some links after this and you'll need to check it out. So, Absolutely. but, uh, anyway, so, uh, anyway, uh, folks, if you haven't seen these movies, you know, you could humor yourself with Godzilla. Don't expect too much. Uh, Kick-Ass, we've given our rates. Uh, Kick-Ass is good, but again, watch No Country for Old Man. I promise you, you're not going to regret it. It's definitely a masterpiece of a movie. I can't say it enough. So, But anyway, uh, Devin, thank you again for joining me. Um, I'll be sure to post this uh, video. Uh, you'll be able to check it once again on Podbean, YouTube, and on Patreon account. So, uh, Devin, what, what else you got? Uh, once once again, tell everybody where they can find you at. Absolutely, guys. You can find me on Facebook, Bridging the Gap. We have a show every Monday at 7 p.m. where we talk about uh, social, political, economical issues, but also things people just disagree about every damn day. Uh, we appreciate people coming in the chat to come chat with us and talk with about the, you know, the hot news topics and everything that's going on in the world. And we want to try and get to a better land of understanding each other rather than just yelling and barking across the, the uh, expanse because that feels like with the social media era, that's kind of where everything's heading, where if you're on the left or you're on the right, you're enemies, which yep. I just don't agree with whatsoever. Uh, same um, here. Yeah, and also um, check out Media to Media, which is my uh, business, which is I uh, you know do media production, which is uh, videography, cinematography, uh, uh, music production here in the in the stretches down the line. Um, and also, guys, uh, thank you again so much for paying attention, listening to us here, and I hope you have a great night. Absolutely. So I couldn't agree more. All right, everybody. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your weekend. Uh, thank you all very much, and y'all have a good evening. Take care now. <laughs>